So we've talked about how moving charges, currents, create magnetic fields. And then we talked about how moving charges experience a force when they're moving in a magnetic field. Well, what is a current? A current is just a moving charge. And if a moving electron or a moving proton in a magnetic field experiences a force, then, well, if those charges are constrained to a wire and they are in a magnetic field, they ought to experience a force as well. Remember that current is defined as the flow of positive charges. So we actually already have the tools to determine what the force on this wire is. So here I have a wire in an external magnetic field. Now we need to be careful. These blue X's do not represent the magnetic field due to the wire, because of course a current carrying wire does create a magnetic field. These blue X's represent some external magnetic field uh, that this wire is living in. I don't know what caused that magnetic field, but it does exist. So can we use right hand rule number two to figure out the direction of the force on this wire? Sure we can. Our thumb goes in the direction of the current, our index finger is in the direction of the field, and our middle finger will be in the direction of the force. That means that there is a force to the left on this wire. And we just use the right hand rule number two that we already knew in order to figure this out. Well, let me bring up a picture of the PowerPoint here. It's the same thing I just showed, but a little bit prettier. Here we see a wire in some external magnetic field, and that wire will experience a force as I just demonstrated. And we can use right hand rule number two to figure out what direction that force is in. So we could think of this as its own right-hand rule, where now our thumb is the current, our field is represented by our index finger, and the force, once again, is our middle finger. But you know what? We really already learned this, because what is a current? Just a moving positive charge. So if we just think of the thumb as representing those moving positive charges, then it can represent either a solitary positive charge, or it could represent a current. Either one works just fine. So we can think about this as just an alternative version, or, you know, in my brain, it's just the same as the right-hand rule we already learned. Why? Because what's a current? A current is a moving charge. A current is a moving positive charge. So here we see uh, the equation for it, and notice it does look very similar to the force on an individual charge. It is just the current times the length times the magnetic field. Now, in this case, the uh, magnetic field and the length may not be perpendicular, so we throw a sine alpha in there. Once again, just like for a moving solitary charge, notice that if alpha is zero, that means I and B are parallel, and that means that there is no force. So there's no force on a current carrying wire when the current is parallel to the field. So this equation here gives us the magnitude, this is the current in the wire, the length of the wire that is in the magnetic field, the magnetic field strength in Tesla, and this is the angle between the field and the current. Notice that for a lot of cases we will have wires perpendicular to fields, in which case our equation simplifies and it ends up looking like this. Um, let's just practice a quick example here. Here we see a horizontal wire, and this says it can be levitated. In other words, held up against the force of gravity if the current in the wire is in what direction? Notice that this arrow right here represents the force of gravity. So this is like a side view of a wire. This is a real wire on Earth. Real wires have weight, therefore it has a force of gravity on it. So can we arrange this? Can we run the current in a direction such that the magnetic force will oppose the gravitational force and levitate this wire? Why don't you try it out and I'll see you on the other side. Okay, so here's my picture. I have my wire. I have the force of gravity down in my field here. Well, if we're going to have this magnetic force levitate the wire or oppose the force of gravity, that means that my magnetic force has to be up. My magnetic force has to be up. Okay, so now let's get out our right hand. Here we have a field into the page. We have a force that's up. That means that the current has to be going to the right. Again, field is in, 
force is up, current has to be to the right. And indeed, power point agrees. On this slide, we see a current carrying wire, and this is the field created by that wire. And we could use right-hand rule number one to confirm that a wire carrying a current upwards will have a field that is out of the board on the left and into the board on the right, as shown in the figure. Well, what if I run another wire in the neighborhood of this first wire? Well, will it experience a force? And the answer is, yes, it will. We could use right-hand rule number two to determine that the force will be Current is up, field is into the board, the force then will be to the left, as indicated in the picture. So, that means that this wire is attracted to this wire. I2, wire number two, is attracted to wire number one because of the magnetic field created by wire number one. Now, in Physics 1, we learned about Newton's third law. Newton's third law says that every single force comes as one member of a pair. And that, 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 that if one object exerts a force on another object, then the opposite is true also. Which means that if wire 1 is exerting a force on wire 2, well, wire 2 is exerting a force on wire 1. And we could see here, we could use our right-hand rule number 1 and 2, to see that the force of on wire one would be to the right, but we could also just trust Newton's third law that it will be equal and opposite, and that if the force on wire two is to the left, then the force on wire one must be to the right. And so we see that two wires carrying currents in the same direction will attract, and two wires carrying currents in opposite directions will repel. And so we can just figure that out using the right-hand rule, uh, but we can also just categorize it as a memorized fact. This is a nice picture right here that helps me to remember this rule. Um, this is a picture of a plumbing pipe. This is a copper plumbing pipe. And a copper plumbing pipe is, of course, a hollow piece of copper. And somebody has run a very, very large current through this piece of copper, and it has crushed it. That's what this has done. And so um, this helps me to remember that parallel currents attract because we can visualize this as uh, this tube of copper. We could visualize it as a whole bunch of currents all in the same direction, spread around the ring of that copper. All of these currents are all in the same direction, and they attract it, and they cause this to collapse. And so for me, this picture right here is a nice visual mnemonic. Uh, if we can remember this picture, then it will help us remember that parallel currents in the same direction attract and then the opposite must be true, that opposite currents repel. Let's do a couple of examples to practice some of what we've learned in this chapter. So here's a question. Uh, here we have a capacitor. So we've got this side charged positive and this side charged negative. Which magnetic field? if it's the correct strength, allows the electron to pass through the charged electrodes without being deflected. And notice we have some selections here, to the right, to the bottom of the page, to the top of the page, out of the page, or into the page. So we want to put that magnetic field in this region to see if the electron can pass through without being deflected. Why don't you try and figure it out, and I'll see you on the other side. Okay, so here I've drawn my picture. Uh, if the electron is going to be undeflected, then that means that the magnetic force must exactly oppose and balance the electric force. So first, what direction is the electric force on the electron? Well, we know that opposites attract and likes repel. So this electron is attracted to the positive plate up here. That is the direction of my F electric. What direction must the magnetic force be in there? Well, if it's going to oppose that, the magnetic force must be in this direction down. Now we have a force and a velocity. We can use our right hand to figure out what direction the field is in. Here's my velocity. My force 
is down. So velocity, force. My right hand rule says out of the board, but we're dealing with an electron. So we have velocity, force, field out of the board. Since it's an electron, we switch our answer and we get the conclusion that it should be into the page. Choice E is into the page, so PowerPoint agrees. Let's do a numerical example. A DC power line near the equator runs east-west. At this location, the Earth's magnetic field is parallel to the ground, points north, and has a magnitude of 50 microtesla. A 400 meter length of the heavy cable that spans the distance between the two towers has a mass of 1,000 kilograms. What direction and magnitude of current would be necessary to offset the force of gravity and levitate the wire? And we'll see that we're going to get an answer that's not terribly realistic. Um, but let's just do the math and see what happens. So we've got this uh, fairly lengthy word problem here. Um, we've got a power line. Um, I think we just need to start drawing some pictures, right? Uh, I think that a uh, top view is going to be best. So I'm just going to sketch a quick picture of a top view of this problem. So here's just a quick sketch. Um, I've labeled my cardinal directions. Never eat soggy waffles. Here's my magnetic field. It says it points straight north. Um, what else do we know? Well, we know that the force of gravity is down. And in this drawing, this is a top view, so down is into the board. So FG is into. That means in order to levitate the wire, that means that my magnetic field must be out of. So if my gravitational force is into the board, in order to levitate the wire, that means my magnetic force must be out of the board. Okay, so now we can get out our right hands. We have a field in this direction. We have a force that is out of the page, which means we must have a current that is going in the east direction. Okay, so it's going to have to head east. What is the magnitude? Well, in order to do the magnitude, we need to do a real quick force problem. In order to balance, these two must equal each other. And so that's where we'll start our math. We'll say that the magnetic force must equal the gravitational force. Well, since we have a current and a field that are perpendicular, we can just use ILB for the magnetic force because the sine of 90 is 1. So my magnetic force is ILB. Of course, my magnet or my gravitational force is M times G. Now, we can just solve now for I. We get MG over LB, and we can now just plug in our numbers. This is 1,000 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared divided by the length, and they tell us in the problem that we have a 400 meter length that weighs 1,000 kilograms. And our magnetic field is 50 times 10 to the negative 6. Tesla's. If we run our calculator, we get an answer of 490,000 amps. Um, notice that in the example statement it says um, 850 amps is more of a typical value for this type of a DC power line. Now, in this country, most of our power lines, or all of our 
high voltage power lines are AC um, because it turns out to work a lot better um, for household electricity. And we'll go into that more um, here in a couple of chapters. All right, let's just do a few more examples here, kind of practice a lot of what we've learned in this chapter. Um, here we see a drawing. Um, we've got a magnet here, which is being repelled, and these red arrows represent forces. So we see a magnet being repelled by a current loop, and I'm wondering what is the direction of current in the loop? Is it out on the top and in on the bottom, in on the top, out on the bottom, or would we get the same effect regardless? Why don't you pause the video, get out your right hand, and see if you can't figure this out. Well, there's a lot of ways to wrap your brain around this one. Uh, I prefer to think about it in terms of poles. Um, if these things are repelling, then we know likes repel and opposites attract. So that means that the south pole of my current loop must be right here and the north pole must be right there, which means that the magnetic field of the current loop must leave here and enter here. Magnetic fields leave north poles and enter south poles. Okay, now we'll get out right hand rule number one, and we see that we have a counterclockwise magnetic field here. That means the current is coming out on the bottom to confirm a current in on top creates a clockwise field around the top. We should have in on top, out on the bottom. Indeed, we do. Here's another one. The diagram below shows slices through two adjacent current loops. Think about the force exerted on the loop on the right due to the loop on the left. The force on the right loop is, well, why don't you consider it and I will see you in a moment. Here are my two current loops. Uh, I can think of a couple ways to approach this one. Uh, are these currents in the same direction or opposite directions? Well, the currents are in the same direction. We know that currents in the same direction attract each other, and so I would expect these two to attract, in which case, if we are thinking about the force on the loop on the right, then that would be to the left. So I think the force is there and there, which means that the force on the loop on the right should be to the left. And PowerPoint does agree. Notice we could have also thought about this as poles, right? So um, here we've got a current going in on top. That means we have a clockwise sense for our magnetic field. That means it's doing this business here. Same thing here. We know that magnetic fields enter south poles leave north poles, enter south poles, leave north poles. Opposites attract. So that's another way to get the same answer. Here's another one. Um, it turns out that a current loop in a magnetic field will experience a torque. Now this is not something that we've uh, dived into in any great depth. In uh, your, your book spends a bit more time talking about it than I do. Um, I feel like we can just approach it from a force perspective, and um, we can say, hey, let's look at this example and see if we can't figure this out. Um, if I release this from rest, what will happen to the current loop? Will it move upward, downward, rotate clockwise, rotate counterclockwise, or do something else? Why don't you uh, give it a whirl, and I'll see you on the other side. Okay, let's just look at the direction of the force on each of the ends of my current loop. On this end, we have a current going into the board. We have a field in this direction. Therefore, we have a downward force. On this side over here, we have a current coming out of the board. We have a field in that direction, which means that we have a force towards the top of 
Ah, we have equal and opposite forces. Therefore, there is no net force on this loop. But I think that it will rotate in a counterclockwise sense in PowerPoint degree.